Hey y'all, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Katrina and this is Today is July 1st and I am going to do my currently reading and pile of possibilities for this month. So I am reading What's Mine and Yours, which I believe is by Naima Coster and I believe it was from my first book of the month box. So far I'm not quite enjoying it and a lot of times when I'm when a book is not giving me what I thought it was supposed to have gave. It's not even giving what y'all said it was supposed to gave. No, I wasted my money. So send me my money back now. Um, <laughs> I will go to Goodreads and start reading what other people are saying. And I'm getting a little down because it seems like a lot of people are having the same um, experience that I'm having. I am, what, maybe a fourth through the book. And like I said, I, I'm not enjoying the non-linear um, storytelling. That is not a, itself, that's not a no-go for me. It's just not working so far in this book. I don't know if I'm gonna finish it. I. Like I said, I, I'm curious. I, I was really excited about it. I thought the book was beautiful. It's an African-American author. I've already supported her by buying the book. <laughs> Still what I'm currently reading, I just haven't picked it up in a while because I've been kind of disappointed in it. So at what point, for those of you who do DNF, at what point do you DNF? I find that I DNF books more so around the 50% mark because it's like, if you haven't caught me at 50%, I'm just, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do it <laughs> it's not gonna do it for me or I'm gonna be annoyed that the whole book was boring and you tried to pull something out of the air the last 20 pages I'm like you could have you don't do that like so I don't know I'm, I'm still really torn about what's mine and yours by Naima Coster so this next book that I am currently reading I just started last night I couldn't sleep. I am and I am just a terrible insomniac. So I start I finish and start lots of books in the middle of the night. Started reading The Cutting Season by Attica Locke. I love seeing that same slow southern build up of a mystery, you know, and a lot of times when it's southern mystery there's like it's geologists can go through and they find what's going on in life by all the different levels of rock and things that have built up. That's what these Southern mysteries kind of give me. Like it's always a bunch of stuff going on. Like there's the murder that happens or whatever, like that brings the person who's left back or the, the parent dies and the, the guy who got out, you know, the lawyer or the doctor who got out has to come back, take care of his family or someone dies and the person who may well has to come back. And so they have to deal with the murder that's going on right then. But then there's always like, you know, some old Ku Klux Klan member or old, you know, hidden murders and hidden crimes. Because there's a lot of stuff like that. And so I love that kind of, it's not quite gothic, but because of the Southern slow um, hiddenness of it, 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 there has to be another word for it that's similar to gothic because it's not horror, but it's mystery. It's like that slow southern mystery. Greg Isles is perfect with it, and now I'm realizing that Attica Locke is a female black person who does it. I read Bluebird, Bluebird, which is a book like it had the typical um, police officer who drank too much, who you know was on the outs with his spouse, still trying to solve a murder but it had that added layer of race come to find out um a lot of these and it's so intricate interesting because in the south a lot of black people and white people are related and you got you know murders or people threatening people or trying to take businesses or fighting over land and you realize y'all related you know and that was some of the stuff that was going on in bluebird bluebird it took it, it elevated that stereotypical drunk uh, police officer 
who has to solve a mystery but the rest of his life is crap like he's good at his job but uh he has to solve the mystery it at it it the 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 southern slowness the race the racial stuff elevated it for me from just a simple thing and so um so right now I'm, i just started listening uh to attica lock on audible so let me I'm going to speed up. I'm going to start speeding up when I read the book descriptions, just so you, you'll know that that's what's going on. But from here on out, I'll speed it up. Um, I'm going to see I, if I can just do 1.25 or 1.5, just so we can get through it really quickly. The American South in the 21st century, a plantation owned for generations by a rich family, so much history and a dead body. Just after dawn, Karen walks the ground of Belle Vie, a historic plantation house in Louisiana that she has managed for four years. Today, she sees nothing unusual apart from some ground that has been dug up by the fence bordering the sugarcane fields. Assuming an animal has been out after dark, she asks the gardener to tidy it up. Not long afterwards, he calls her to say it's something else, something terrible, a dead body. At a distance, she missed her, the girl, the dirt, the blood. Now, she has police on the site. An investigation is in progress and a member of staff no one can track down. And Karen keeps uncovering things she wish she didn't know. As she's drawn into the dead girl's story, she makes shattering discoveries about the future of Belle V, the secrets of its past, and sees more clearly than ever that Belle V, its beauty, is not to be trusted. A magnificent, sweeping story of the South, the cutting season brings history face to face with modern America, where Obama is president, but some things will never change. Attica Locke, once again, provides an unblinking commentary on politics, race, the law, family, and love, all within a thriller, every bit as gripping and tragic as her first novel, Blackwater Rising. Um, the other two books that I'm reading are the ones that I'm currently reading to my kids, Maya and the Dark Rising. And uh, this one is quite good, actually. I'm quite enjoying this one. We stopped reading Holopox. Um, both my daughter and I were enjoying the Morrigan uh, the Nevermore books. I can't think of her last name. Morrigan is her first name. We liked the first two, but the third one is kind of going off the rail a little bit, so we stopped reading that. I don't know if we'll come back to it. It's up to my daughter. But Maya and the Rising Dark by Rena Barron is, has been very good. My daughter um, has laughed at certain areas. Um, I have been worried that she'd be scared because there's some very scary sections. Um, but Maya is 12 and my daughter's just turned 11, so and this is great. Let me read you the... I normally don't um, read the stuff that I'm reading to the kids, but this is one of the books that I probably would have read for myself, a, a middle grade horror book that I would have read for myself, and I, we are enjoying it. So I'm going to go ahead and read the description. This again is Maya and the Dark Rising, book one by Rena Barron. 12-year-old Maya's search for her missing father puts her in the center of a battle between our world, the Orishas, and the mysterious, sinister, dark world. 12-year-old Maya is the only one in her Southside Chicago neighborhood who witnesses weird occurrences like were hyenas stalking the streets at night and a scary man made of shadows plaguing her dreams. Her friends try to find an explanation, perhaps a ghost uprising or a lunchroom experimentation gone wrong. But to Maya, it sounds like something from one of her papa's stories or her favorite comics. When Papa goes missing, Maya is thrust into a world both strange and familiar as she uncovers the truth. Her father is the guardian of the veil between our world and the dark, where an army led by the Lord of the Shadows, the man from Maya's nightmare, awaits. Maya herself is a godling, half Orisha and half human, and her neighborhood is a safe haven. But now that the veil is falling, the Lord of Shadows is determined to destroy the human world, and it's up to Maya to stop him. She just hopes she can do it in time to attend Comic-Con before summer is over. So we are really enjoying this book so far. So, and then of course, for my little baby, we are reading through all of the Galaxy Exact books, and we are now on Monsters in Space by Ray O'Ryan and Colin Jack. Now on to my pile of possibilities. I am going to read The Devil in Silver by Victor Lavelle. He is com becoming one of my favorite uh, horror, read, uh, horror writers. So here is the book description. Pepper is a rambunctious, big man, minor league troublemaker, working class hero in his own mind, and suddenly a surprise inmate of a budget strapped mental institution in Queens, New York. He's not mentally ill, but that does not seem to matter. He is accused of a crime he can't quite square with his memory. In the darkness of his room, on the first night, he is visited by a terrifying creature with the body of an old man and the head of a bison who nearly kills him before being hustled away by the hospital staff. 
It's no delusion. The other patients confirm that a hungry devil roams the hallway when the sun goes down. Pepper rallies three other inmates in a plot to fight back. Dory, an octogenarian schizophrenic who's been on the ward for decades and knows all its secrets. Coffee, an African immigrant with severe OCD who tries desperately to send alarms to the outside world. And Luchi, a bipolar teenage girl who acts as the group's enforcer. Battling the pill-pushing staff, one another, in their own minds, they try to kill the monster that's stalking them. But can the devil die? The Devil in Silver brilliantly brings together the compelling themes that spark all of Victor Lavelle's radiant fiction. Faith, race, class, madness, and our relationship with the unseen and the uncanny. More than that, it is, thrillingly, it is a thrillingly suspenseful work of literary horror about friendship, love, and the courage to slay our own demons. That sounds great. It also sounds great to me because all of these things are interesting to me. Faith, race, class, madness. I am bipolar myself. Um, I used to be a fundamentalist and I now struggle with how do I teach my children a progressive faith while I'm still gripping with what I believe. Um, Obviously, I am very interested in race and class. I talk about it a lot. I read about it a lot here on the channel. I read and talk about it a lot here on the channel. I love Victor Lavelle. I love horror stories. This, I, 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 I should stop hyping myself up so that I'm not disappointed, but I can't help it. I'm very excited about this book. And these next two books are part of projects that I'm doing, ongoing projects that I'm doing here on the channel. The first one is teaching myself, well, this is the first book that I'm going to talk about, but this is the second book that I'm reading in trying to teach myself about um, prison abolition. Now, <clears throat> this one, um, I read the first one I read, I have it on the channel here, is um, Our Prisons Obsolete, and it's by Angela Davis, the Angela Davis, and it was a very precise, um, short, like one-on-one introduction into like why we need to you know why this country only has what five percent of the world's population but we have 25 percent of the world's incarcerated um she ties together the history of our carceral system she talks about um the connection between slavery and today and you know the slave codes and black co codes now and how our inability or unwillingness to deal with the mentally ill and the poor and um, all of those kinds of ills fall on the police and that you know in with ends up with people being in prison and also how prisons are uh, tied to capitalism so <clears throat> that was a, a very insightful basic book and I feel like the next step now will be this here um, rethinking incarceration by Dominique Dubois Gilliard or Gilliard I don't know if that's a hard G or not advocating for justice that restores <clears throat> Okay, I just said this. <laughs> the United States has more people locked up in jails, prisons, and detention centers than any other country in the history of the world. Now, one thing I want to say is that um, both um, Angela Davis, and I'm going to assume that this book too, because they talked about different kinds of things, they talk about juvenile detention and they also talk about immigrants being locked up at the border and things like that. So it's not just public prisons and private prisons, but they're talking about public prisons, private prisons, juvenile detention centers, um, and immigration um, detention centers and things like that. Mass incarceration has become a lucrative industry and the cr criminal justice system is plagued with biased and unjust practices and the church is unwittingly contributed to the problem. Dominique Gilliard explores the history and fun foundation of mass incarceration, examining Christianity's role in its evolution and expansion. He then shows how Christians can pursue justice that restores and reconciles, offering creative solutions and highlighting innovative interventions. Discover how you can bring authentic rehabilitation, lasting transformation, and healthy reintegration into this broken system. Now the next project um, that I've been doing has been my Toni Morrison project where I read through some of her books and the next one is Song of Solomon. This one's a little thicker than the first two. Uh, let me read the very short, thankfully, as for some reason all of her descriptions are quite short. I wonder if I read it on Goodreads would it be as short but anyway. 
Milkman Dead is born shortly after a neighborhood eccentric hurled himself off a rooftop in a vain attempt at flight. For the rest of his life, he too will be trying to fly. With his brilliantly imagined novel, Nobel Prize laureate, Toni Morrison audaciously transfigures the coming of age story as she follows Milkman from his Rust Belt city to the place of his family's origin. M Morrison introduces an entire cast of strivers and seersists and liars and assassins, the inhabitants of a fully realized black world. I think it's interesting that last sentence or the last part of that sentence, the, the inhabitants of a fully realized black world and that she felt that she failed in her first two books by allowing the white gaze to affect her books and it was always a project of hers to write wholly black books for by filled with black perspectives black people people would ask her interviewers would ask her can you ever write about white people and she goes I'm, I'm very offended by that do you ever ask you know any other writer you know a white writer do they need to, you know shouldn't they add black people to their books and things like that she's always really you know she's and she's like powerful i wouldn't say soft-spoken but her voice she never raises her voice but her answer to that is is pointed and direct and no nonsense but it's it's um it's soft and um dignified without having to be caustic or mean and I love it. So I haven't read a Stephen King in a while and there's a pretty new one out. I think it came out, yeah, it came out this year in March and it's called Later. The son of a struggling single mother, Jamie Conklin, just wants an ordinary childhood. But Jamie is no ordinary child. Born with an unnatural ability his mother urges him to keep secret, Jamie can see what no one else can see and learn what no one else can learn. But the cost of using this ability is higher than Jamie can imagine. As he discovers when the NYPD detective draws him into the pursuit of a killer who has th threatened to strike from beyond the grave. Later is Stephen King at his finest, a, a terrifying and touching story of innocence lost and the trial that tests our sense of right and wrong. With echoes of King's classic novel, It, Later is a powerful, haunting, unforgettable exploration of what it takes to stand up to evil in all the faces it wears. This is quite a short book. It's only 248 pages. Mm, I'm trying to, I'm just looking at some of the ratings. Doesn't have a really high amount of five stars on Goodreads, um, but it does have a lot of four stars. So people can be really fickle about Stephen King. So I don't. I don't worry about the ratings as much when it comes to Stephen King because you either like him or you don't. You either, you know you really just either love him or you don't. So that is in my pile of possibilities, but that's much more of a. It's almost a definite because I, I I've been wanting to read another Stephen King, and you know I've read most of his old stuff that I want to read and I've read the new stuff that I want to read like the Institute and things like that I've already read those things so it's like what else is there and I because I'm not interested in the gunslinger series and things like that so I was glad when he came out with this one now I have two books with the word plot in it first is the family plot I've already talked about this book when I got it from thrift books when it came in I had ordered it <laughs> I thought it was this other book that I'm going to talk about after this because this is the book that everybody on booktube is talking about but I'm still very interested in the family plot because it reminds me of the Twisted Ones which uh, was a book by T. King Fisher that I absolutely love me and my son read that and that book was about a girl who goes home and clears a house and finds all this scary you know stuff and this kind of sounds the same way. Music City Salvage is a family operation owned and operated by Chuck Dutton, master stripper of doomed historic properties and expert sellers of all things old and crusty. But business is lean and times are tight, so he is thrilled when an aged and esteemed Augusta Withrow appears in his office, bearing an offer he really ought to refuse. She has a massive family estate to unload, lock, stock, and barrel. For a check and a handshake, it's all his. It's a big check, it's a firm handshake, and it's enough of a gold mine that he assigns his daughter Dahlia to personally oversee the project. Dahlia preps a couple of trucks, takes a small crew, and they caravan down to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where the ancient Withrow house is waiting. And so is a barn, a carriage house, and a small overgrown cemetery that Augusta Withrow left out of the paperwork. Augusta Withrow left out a lot of things. The property is in unusually great shape for a condemned building. It's empty 
but it isn't abandoned. Something in the Withrow Mansion is angry and lost. This is the last chance to raise hell before the house is gone forever, and there's still pr plenty of room in the strange little family plot. The book that everyone is talking about on booktube is The Plot, and it's by Jean Hanneth Korlitz. Korlitz? Jean Hanneth Korlitz. Here is the description. Jacob Finch Bonner was once a promising young novelist with a respectably published first book. Today, he's teaching in a third-rate MFA program and struggling to maintain what's left of his self-respect. He hasn't written, let alone published, anything decent in years. When Evan Parker, his most arrogant student, announces he doesn't need Jake's help because the plot of his book in progress is a sure thing, Jake is prepared to dismiss the boast as typical amateur narcissism, but then he hears the plot. Jacob returns to the downward trajectory of his own career and braces himself for the supernova publication of Evan Parker's first novel, but it never comes. When he discovers that his former student has died, presumably without ever completing his book, Jake does what any self-respecting writer would do with a story like that, a story that absolutely needs to be told. In a few short years, all of Evan Parker's predictions have come true, but Jake is the author enjoying the wave. He is wealthy, famous, and praised, and read all over the world. But at the height of his glorious new life, an email arrives, the first salvo in a terrifying anonymous campaign. You are a thief, it says. As Jake struggles to understand his antagonist and hide the truth from his readers and his publishers, he begins to learn more about his late student, and what he discovers both amazes and terrifies him. Who was Evan Parker and how did he get the idea for his sure thing of a novel? What is the real story behind the plot? And who stole it from whom? So that sounds pretty darn good. So that's the last of my currently reading and my pile of possibilities. I will most definitely be reading tons of tiny little books, uh, you know, little uh, paranormal romances in the middle and funny science fictions. I put in a playlist, um, there is a booktuber who is, she is, she is extraordinarily intelligent. She um, has a master's degree. She talks, so she, I, I love how she talks about um, her religious change. And, and I think she went and got her, I believe she went and got her master's based on the change that she was going through coming out of a fundamental church. Uh, she reads um, classics and she reads um agatha christie you know and stuff like that and she reads ice planet barbarians and the side changeling series so i have the first ice planet barbarians book um in my uh, playlist so we'll we'll see if i get to that um this <laughs> this 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 month um, and I, I just love that. I love that about her. It's books like whoa. It's Mara um, at books like whoa, and like she, there's. It's so funny because I get these weird books from her. She's also into this murder bot series, is murder. But at the same time, she has recommended a book that I can't really wait to get into, and it's called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. So this is. Um, I don't think I'll get to this this month, but just to talk about the difference of book recommendations that I get from her. Um, this is definitely something that's right up my alley. Like I said, race, theology, um, class, all of that stuff is like, I, I don't know if I ever decided to go for my master's, I'd have to figure out what way I would go. It, it would have to deal with one of, one of those things or all of those things mixed together in some type of way. The cross and the lynching tree are the two most emotionally charged symbols in the history of African American community. In this powerful new work, theologian James H. Cone explores these symbols and their interconnection in the history and souls of black folk. Both the cross and the lynching tree represent the worst in human beings and at the same time a thirst for life that refuses to let the worst determine our final meaning. While the lynching tree symbolizes white power and black death, the cross symbolizes divine power and black life. God overcoming the power of sin and death. For African Americans, the image of Jesus hung on a tree to die, powerfully grounded their faith in God and that God was with them even in the suffering of the lynching era. In a work that spans social history, theology, and cultural studies, Cohn explores the message of the spirituals and power of the blues, the passion and engaged vision of Martin Luther King Jr. He invokes the spirits of Billie Holiday and Langston Hughes, Fannie Lou Hamer and Ida B. Wells, and the witness of black artists, writers, preachers, and fighters of justice. And he remembers the victims, especially the 5,000 who perished during the lynching period. Through their witness, he contemplates the greatest challenge of any Christian theology to explain how life can be made meaningful in the face of death 
and Injustice. So yeah, I got it from her. She gave it five stars. So I just, I think it's so interesting that someone who I've gotten these crazy recommendations uh, about side changeling series, Ice Planet Barbarians, where we're talking about blue ping. There's another one. Oh, Murder Bots and things like that also talks about something that sounds so powerful. So I, I, I love that about her channel and her recommendation and the width of her um, reading subjects. So, if you got to the end of this uh, video, just give me a, I'll just put up a um, emoji. I didn't take time to look up one, so I'll put one up here. You be easing yourself, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. <music>